Uh -huh. um, I like to change the slides with this one. Can I? Does it work? This one. Can, can you make it working? Okay, thank you very much for the uh, introduction and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Um, so the uh, topic that I was uh, uh, asked to cover, synchrotron radiation X-ray powder diffraction, it has a fairly wide uh, breadth and therefore it requires that we make a certain number of choices in the discussion. So I have decided to organize this lecture in this way. Um, usually, when I discuss synchrotron radiation, I often like to start with an historical introduction to synchrotron radiation, explaining how synchrotron radiation is produced. Um, but this time, I think I can, in this school, I think I can safely assume that uh, you know what synchrotron radiation is and how it is produced. So I will only make a very brief recall to these basic principles, and I will mostly concentrate on the properties of synchrotron radiation, in particular in relation to the different kind of sources. So we have heard um, in this uh, couple of uh, yesterday very often uh, the um, bending magnet swiggler undulator. So I will try to um, explain to you uh, what are the differences between these uh, uh, sources and uh, what are the different properties. And then I will uh, um, discuss the, um, the uh, synchrotron radiation um, optics, in particular uh, well, the one uh, uh, that is relevant for XRPD. And then I will uh, briefly uh, discuss also the XRPD diffractometer and uh, a little bit of detectors. And I will conclude with a few highlights. Uh, now, when I was preparing this lecture, I realized that uh, the time was not allowing me to discuss uh, many other little topics that I do believe important to understand, and therefore, instead of throwing that completely out, I um, placed them in, uh, in what I call the material for further thinking and discussion, since we are spending the full week together. So I prepare view graphs for that, but I will not touch uh, that now, but you find these uh, view graphs, so you find uh, the PDF of this presentation and this additional material on the um, intranet of the RH School. So you are very welcome to go and then you, if it raises your interest, you can come to me and we can discuss. Okay, so let's start with, the, uh, with this um, brief recall first. So you know that um, when a charged particle is accelerated, it emits electromagnetic radiation. Now, if the speed of the moving charged particle is much smaller than the speed of light, then the, this electromagnetic radiation emitted is uh, emitted pretty much isotropically around the moving particle, and we call it cyclotron radiation. Now, if the speed of the charged moving particle reaches um, uh, uh, values that are very close to the speed of light, then relativistic effects dramatically change the properties of this electromagnetic radiation emitted, um, which becomes um, extremely, uh, which loses completely this isotropic character and becomes very directional. And so we will discuss these properties in particular. Um, the, so the, the most striking um, property is this directionality of, of radiation. And the intrinsic angular spread of synchrotron radiation is proportional to is, all, is the approximately proportional to one over gamma, where gamma is the um, is the electron of the is the energy of the um, moving uh, charged particle in its units of uh, rest energy. So, for example, for well here you understand immediately why we like to uh, accelerate electrons because of their small mass, and then you see that for example here in the case of um, so of electrons, then this gamma factor is going to be approximately 2,000 times the energy of the electrons, of the moving electrons, in GeV. So for the SLS, for example, where I work, which is a medium energy facility, 2.4 GeV, 
then gamma is going to be approximately a bit less than 5,000. And so from here, you understand also another thing, that uh, the higher is the energy of the facility, of the electron, uh, of the electron energy, the smaller will be the intrinsic angular spread. Okay, so let's um, here look at this uh, schematic representation of a synchrotron facility. So very briefly, you have, so the electrons are produced in this uh, linear, a linear accelerator and injected into the booster, which is a sort of pre-storage ring. And then after they are injected into the main storage ring, where uh, uh, magnetic dipoles, these bending magnets, force them to circulate, to um, circulate in, uh, so to move in circular orbits. And the uh, uh, centripetal acceleration um, applied produces electromagnetic radiation. Then there are uh, radio frequency cavity that um, restore the energy which is lost by electromagnetic radiation. Now the other thing that you notice here, so there are bending magnets, so the, the radiation can be extracted either from the bending magnet or from uh, uh, insertion device. You see that it's not a perfect circle, and indeed it is like that. There are these so-called straight sections where you insert these insertion devices, and we will see a bit better the uh, properties of that. And then the radiation is uh, extracted, and uh, it is conditioned by the appropriate optics, which really depends on the kind of experiments that you want to do. We will see that for XRPD. And then it is brought to the experimental station. So what are the properties of synchrotron radiation? Well, tunable photon energy, and then um, uh, Pamela was also mentioning, and I mean, this is the, one of the properties of synchrotron radiation, the fact that you can change the energy. Now, and, and this is the advantages of that are very clear, because you can just hit or avoid an absorption edge. You can tune the, um, um, the um, uh, you, you can choose the right energy in order to um, minimize the absorption in case you work in transmission and so on. Now, depending on the kind of source that you have, then the emission spectrum can be fairly wide and continuous, and this is the case of a bending magnet or a Wiggler, and we will understand later on why. Or it can be a sort of Yagi um, spectrum, but always co covering a relatively wide energy range. And we will see how it is reached also in this case. So the other important properties of synchrotron radiation is the high spectral brightness. Essentially, this is, um, this is the, uh, uh, the, uh, pro the parameter that tells you how concentrated and intense is the uh, photon beam. And it is defined as the photons per second per unit uh, uh, area of the radiating source and periodic solid angle of the radiating cone and per fractional bandwidth. Then it has a certain degree of polarization. So the beam is linearly polarized in the plane of the orbit. And this is exploited by, um, uh, uh, by XRPD. Um, in the ap appendix, uh, you understand in more details why. That's why the, the uh, diffractometers are placed vertically in a synchrotron. Um, then it has a certain time structure, which is uh, caused by this uh, restoring uh, via the um, uh, radio frequency cavity, which uh, makes, uh, causes the electron bunching. So the electrons do not circulate um, uniformly, but are grouped in bunches, and therefore they give a certain time structure to the beam. Of course, this depends on the radio and the specific radio frequency uh, value on uh, how you fill up this, um, uh, these bunches of electrons. But just to give you an idea, at the SLS, the distance between two uh, successive um, bunches of um, electrons is two nanoseconds, and the length of a bunch is uh, between 10 and 100 picoseconds. And then the uh, radiation has a certain le level of coherence, transversal, so due to the intrinsic uh, size and divergence of the source, and longitudinal, uh, to, uh, linked to the uh, intrinsic, uh, to the residual uh, uh, monochromaticity of, uh, um, of the, um, uh, so to the, um, yeah, the lack of uh, total monochromaticity. Okay, so, so we come back to our sketch. So we said the electrons circulate, and then when they, um, so they, they, they are forced to go into circles, into a circle, and uh, the centripetal acceleration uh, produced by these um, um, dipoles uh, produce electromagnetic radiation. So then alternatively, the radiation we have already said um, is produced, um, is extracted by these insertion devices. Um, I think I look at the other because I have a different um, so, what are these insertion devices? devices? These are multiple magnets, essentially, uh, that forces the electrons 
that enter these trace sections to, to wiggles, so to do, um, to do um, oscillations inside these, uh, these multiple magnets. And, uh, and the electrons, they emit electromagnetic radiation at each oscillation. Now, so what is the, the difference, essentially, between a wiggler and an undulator? They're both multiple magnets. Uh, so the difference essentially is in really the size of these excursions that the electrons are forced to per perform, which is fairly large in the case of a wiggler and very gentle in the case of the undulator. Being so gentle makes it possible to have a coherent superposition of these single oscillations. And so the pulse that is produced is uh, perceived as a, as a longer coherent pulse. In the case of the wiggler, it's an incoherent superposition. So you have the sum of uh, very short pulses. Um, now, what makes uh, a, um, a, these excursions large? So how can you, can you make a multiple magnet working as a wiggler or as an undulator? Well, um, certainly the period, so this lambda u, this period of the multiple magnet, and the magnetic field, the average magnetic field that you apply to your multiple magnet. So therefore, what you usually see is the definition of this uh, k parameter, which is a, a constant, times the uh, period of the, of the multiple magnet and the average magnetic field. So k smaller or uh, around 1 defines an undulator behavior, and k much larger than 1 defines a wiggler. There is a physical meaning of that, which is quite interesting. So remember that uh, uh, 1 over gamma defines the natural um, uh, angular spread of the single electron uh, synchrotron radiation emission. So if we call alpha the maximum uh, uh, deflection angle that is induced by these wiggles, then a k is, uh, is uh, the uh, gamma times alpha. So k um, close to 1 means, or smaller than 1, means that this uh, intrinsic, uh, I mean, this, this um, maximum uh, deviation is smaller or maximum of the same order of magnitude of this intrinsic um, uh, angular spread. And therefore, coherent superposition is indeed possible. OK, so. <clears throat> um, so again, this is the, so the, the same sketch that we, uh, that we saw before. So the uh, centripetal acceleration produces electromagnetic uh, radiation. So the peak emission wavelength, or energy, therefore, will depend on the angular speed of the moving electron, but depends also on these relativistic effects, which is absolutely important. So now I would like you to, um, to appreciate the importance of these relativistic effects. So remember that gamma, we said, for the SLS, for example, is around 5,000. So this means that the relativistic effects shorten the wavelength of the emitted radiation by a factor of 2 gamma squared, which is between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8. So it's a dramatic change of the wavelength that is emitted. Otherwise, it will not be in the X-ray uh, range that we do like. Um, now, usually you find this critical wavelength or energy that I um, wrote it here with these practical units, but don't, I mean, it's just that if we want to calculate something, so I summarize that here. Now, the bound emission spectrum, so you have each electron produces a very short pulse, so of the order of 10 to the minus 20, and therefore for the bandwidth Fourier theorem, this translates in a fairly wide uh, frequency range, and therefore a fairly wide energy range or wavelength range, which explains why a bending magnet, and we'll see also for the Wiggler, you have this wide uh, emission spectrum. Um, then the angular spread, so it is uh, uh, in the vertical direction, so vertical with respect to the orbit, it will be given by the natural uh, angular uh, spread that we already discussed. And in the horizontal direction, I mean, the electrons behave like a, a mini torch light when they go through the uh, bending magnet, and therefore they will be illimited in a sense, or limited by your, by your acceptance. The undulator, on the other hand, as we um, already mentioned, you have this coherent superposition of the single pulses, and therefore the um, the wavelength, that is, so the peak emission wavelength or energy, will be given by the, uh, the um, period of, of your insertion device, shortened again by the same factor 2 gamma square. So you see, okay, that, that's the way how you change the energy, though, in this case. So these um, 
you probably suspect that there will be not be a, a, such a wide uh, um, emission since uh, you have this coherent superposition which makes the pulse a longer pulse. So well, you can either play with the um, with the, uh, the, the period, but this is something that you fix as soon as you have constructed your undulator. Or you can change the uh, gamma. The gamma is de depends, you remember, the electron energy, so you, it's not very realistic because it means that you would expect that to change the electron energy when you want to change the energy, which will not make you at least not very popular in a synchrotron facility. So in reality, Gamma has a dependence on beta, so that this gamma depends on the, um, on the, um, um, the uh, emission in the, in the forward direction for an electron moving in the east to straight section. It doesn't take into account the fact that it uh, oscillates. And so in reality, there is a dependence on the average magnetic field here. So this is the more correct expression, fortunately, because this means that this dependence of K allows you to play with this uh, beta. So you can change the average magnetic field and change the energy, change the fundamental energy emitted by the undulator. And how you do that? You change the gap of the undulator. So that's why you change, you achieve, you can change the energy that is emitted by an undulator by changing the gap. This is the mechanism. In reality, um, the, it's only when the magnetic field, the average magnetic field is very small, then the emission is concentrated, the intensity of the emitted radiation is concentrated in the fundamental uh, emission. In reality, you do have also emission at, uh, um, in the, in corresponding to the higher harmonics in case um, for higher B values. And therefore, this is essentially what you do. You um, exploit the fundamental energy and the higher harmonics. And you tune the gap in such a way that instead of having a sharp emission, only one wavelength, then you have this Yagi uh, spectrum, but still a, over a wide energy range. And here I didn't point out these numbers. These are the harmonics, uh, the higher harmonics. OK, so again, in the... Uh, units, uh, practical units. Then you have a sharp emission spectrum because the mechanism is different. For the same reason why you have the, uh, a shorter pulse and therefore a wide um, spectrum, then you have a, a, a fairly lo longer pulse because you have a coherent superposition and therefore you have a very sharp emission spectrum. And you have a sort of grating effect. So the, the larger is the number of the, uh, of the poles, then the, more sharp, the sharper will be the uh, emission spectrum and the, most in, the more intense. The angular spread is a good surprise in case of undulators because it is further reduced by a factor of square root of n because of this grazing, uh, sort of grazing effect. And the intensity is enhanced by a factor of n squared. That's why you really like, I mean, this is the, you really like to work with uh, with an undulator. Okay, so now very quickly, in the case of a wiggler, then you can consider them like a, a, a series of bending magnets somehow. So you have a critical wavelength, the same. But in this case, you, have a, you can play with a local, you have a local B value. It's not the one that defines the properties of the, uh, of the electron circulating in the, in the ring. And therefore, you can make it large enough to locally have a higher critical energy. And this is the reason why we were working on a, on a Wiggler source in order to reach the higher energies. Okay, so you have a broad emission spectrum, as in the case of the, uh, of the bending magnet, and an angular spread, which is uh, similar to that of a uh, bending magnet, only limited by uh, in the horizontal direction. And you have a higher intensity. Okay, so, so now I, I hope you um, understand a bit better uh, the, uh, the properties of these sources. So now you need to um, uh, decide what kind of experiments you want to perform. So you have, presumably you have chosen your source, and now you have to um, condition that li the uh, radiation that is emitted by that source. And depending on the source and on what you want to do, then you have to decide your optical elements. Okay, so let's talk about XRPD. So usually when you go to a synchrotron, you want to do typically high resolution, so full method of maximum resolution, angular resolution, high throughput, time resolved. Um, this is what you usually want to do. So um, your wish list to do that is uh, a wide energy range. So this is the example of our beam line, 5 to 40. It depends uh, pretty much on the kind of ring that you are sitting at. Um, high intensity. 
and then high angular resolution, dynamic focusing capabilities. You want to work with a very parallel beam for very high resolution, but you want to focus if you want to do time resolved, for example. So ideally, you want to have a dynamic focusing capabilities. And then you have to want to have a very clean uh, beam, so free from the uh, contamination of higher harmonics. So how can you do that? Well, these first two um, requirements are pretty much linked to the source. No? Then we have to see that. The second uh, three um, are pretty much um, influencing the choice of the optics. Of course, the angular resolution depends also on the diffractometer and the detector, of course, but first it depends on the choice of the optics. So, <clears throat> so we, we can go through the example of, the, um, of, of our beamline, which uh, used to be a, a wiggler beamline, now we are upgrading to an undulator to understand what these uh, parameters, um, what influence they have. So the SLS, um, we started being a, a wiggler uh, beamline because we wanted to have the 40 kV, so the higher energy. And then at that time, the only um, possible, I mean, if we would have worked with, a, with an undulator, which was certainly preferable, then the maximum energy would have been 25 kV. And therefore, we opted for the wiggler. And you, I hope now you understand why, because we can locally um, push the uh, critical energy towards the higher values. So 10 years later, um, through a development of the undulators, um, we have been able to uh, install a new prototype of undulator, so a shorter period undulator, with uh, new, ma new materials that have higher B, in such a way that we can keep the same K value and therefore the same energy range, but work with uh, undulator properties. This is essentially. Now the choice of the optics that influence these, uh, these other uh, uh, elements in our wish list. So high angular resolution. Well, this depends certainly on the high energy, so the ingredients to get high angular resolution, so uh, full width of maximum resolution, that certainly depend on the high energy resolution and uh, highly collimated photon beam. This is the two things that you have to achieve. Well, obviously, there is a correlation between the energy resolution and the final angular resolution. You can think about the Bragg law and you understand that immediately. So what you have to buy is certainly a monochromator. So typically, you use a double crystal monochromator and a collimating mirror no? to make it collimated, that you bend and you therefore collimate. Now, depending on the kind of source, you should never forget what you have as a source, because if you have a fairly divergent source, then the collimations must be done before the, monochroma, the monochromator. Why that? Because if you get in a, uh, in a double crystal monochromator with a divergent end polychromatic beam, then you will not have a fantastic uh, monochromatization of your beam, because uh, uh, the different rays will find a way through. So you need to collimate before. And then, depending on the angle, then you will select the energy that you want to work with. Then usually, well, as I said, you want a dynamic focusing capabilities also in the other direction. So you typically, you, um, you also have a bendable second crystal, so you can focus also or collimate in the other direction. Then, <coughs> if you have collimate, you, 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 so after you have collimated, if you want to, um, after the monochromatization, if you want to focus the beam, then you typically um, have a second mirror, uh, so a collimating mirror, and therefore you can reach your dynamic focusing capabilities that are okay by bending it. Now, the two mirrors together, then they guarantee a higher harmonic rejection, which is better than 10 to the minus 7, and, um, and therefore you, in principle, are set. Now here, I don't go through this, but this is something that you might use as an exercise. This is our optics before October 2010 and now as it is now. And you can play with that. So you see the optical elements are the same, but they are exchanged. And there is a reason for all these. So maybe you can try to see whether these things is clear to you and go through this example and maybe come and see me if, uh, if you want to discuss. Okay, so that is very quickly how it looked like and how it looked like now. It's the really big pieces of equipment. Okay, so now we are at this stage. So we have gone through the uh, searching devices and optics and now the experimental hatch. Now the, <coughs> so
so that I will not be able to go through all these details, but uh, a powder diffraction station so, um, consists of a diffractometer, detector one or more than one, and then various kind of sample environments. What you will own, and in the synchrotron very often what we, you will be hosting from your user. So Pamela already made this point, try to be flexible, to keep your instrument flexible. At the synchrotron, I, I really insist on that. I, I saw this mistake done many times, that you have a fancy instrument and then you realize that you don't have the space to mount things at the top. So this is very important. Um, so this is um, a cartoon that, ex that shows how um, it looks like our diffractometer. So we have a three coaxial uh, diffractometer with very high uh, precision and accuracy. Um, so one of the um, angular degrees of freedom is uh, devoted to the sample, uh, the sample or sample environment. And again, here we have left enough space to uh, be able to host really exotic experiments. Um, and transfer the weight uh, uh, elsewhere in this cart, this precision cart, if it is too heavy. And the other two degrees of freedom are devoted to the detectors. We have two detectors, a multi-crystal analyzer detector and a microstrip detector, and then we'll describe it in, in a little bit. Um, okay. That, now it is how it looks like in the uh, clean days. Swiss uh, clean day, so when, when there is not too much mess around, this is uh, yeah, the automatic sample ch um, uh, changer that we use essentially for industrial applications because it allows us to measure fairly fast. And this is how it looks like when a user comes and wants to do a microwave assisted heating experiment. So they come with all these bunches of, of equipment and we have to align these things. So it is very important that we have enough space around and enough flexibility. That's very important. Okay, so <clears throat> um, a little words about these uh, detectors. You have heard already uh, yesterday um, m more than once this multi-crystal analyzer detector. So we do have um, a, one, one of such a detectors in, which operates in the upper hemisphere and uh, we have a metan solid state microstrip detector in the lower hemisphere that can work also above in case it's necessary. Um, so here you see a schematic representation of this uh, um, uh, analyzer detector. So essentially the diffracted rays coming from the sample before reaching the detector is intercepted by an analyzer crystal. So you do angular selection of your diffracted beam, which uh, gives you a lot of advantages. First of all, a very, very high resolution, uh, but also a lot of other advantages that I discussed in this appendix as well. But for example, you are independent on the sample size, on the precise alignment is, is very important. Um, now, since this costs a lot of photons, because essentially it's like having slits of the size of the Darwin width of your uh, silicon uh, analyzer crystal, so it's, it's very uh, photon consuming, then the people at ESRF, so Hode and uh, co-workers, they um, had a very smart ideas and, um, um, and designed a um, uh, multi-crystal analyzer detector where very easily you can uh, set a series of independent crystals um, <clears throat> and then you can set at the correct Bragg angle for the given working photon energy all together by simply moving um, the uh, setting up the um, angle of this uh, of this goniometer. So the, the crystals are mounted at, at the fan they have an offset one with, with, with the other, and they will intercept the diffracted rays one after the other. And so the only requirement that you have, I mean, you have, a, you have n crystals, you will have n times the statistics, and the only requirement is to correct for this offset. Now, the other detector that we have <coughs> is, uh, is something that uh, has been uh, designed at the, um, at the SLS by Beth Schmidt and co-workers. Um, this is a modular detector, is a silicon solid state uh, detector, single photon counting, and I will explain to you what it, what it means, sorry. Um, so it's a, it's a modular detector, each module uh, in our configuration at the distance at which we have mounted them covers approximately 5 degrees in 2 theta, and it's a modular detector, so you can cover a wide uh, 2 theta range depending on how many uh, modules you mount. 
So in our case, we have 24 of them, and we cover 120 degrees at once. Um, <coughs> so the, um, um, the, the detector consists on the silicon uh, strips, microstrip sensor, so which is sitting here. So each strip, uh, each uh, sensor, sorry, has um, 1,280 independent strips um, that have a pitch, which means the distance strip to strip of 50 microns, which defines uh, the intrinsic resolution of the detector, which is not the final resolution because this is a position sensitive, sensitive detector and therefore you have to always keep in mind the size of your sample. And then is a 300 micron thick, which uh, defines the uh, efficiency, not the final efficiency. Um, and so at the end we have is a detector with more than 30,000 independent channels, not because we have 24 of these uh, modules. The readout chip is a very, very fast. So is, um, so by the way, here, the readout chips are here. There are 10 for each modules, each with 128 channels. These are independent channels. And the readout time ranges from 250 microseconds to 90 microseconds. This is really the dead time of the detector. It's nothing you can do against it. And it really depends on the, um, the, the reading that is done in series of these 128 channels. The other is done in parallel. So if you have uh, one chip or 10, 10 chips, it's the same. The uh, modules is also the same. It's done in parallel, but this is nothing you can do against. What you can do, you can reduce the dynamic range, so you have less to read, and therefore you can reduce the dynamic range, and then you can go to up, down to 90 microseconds, but nothing you can do against these 90 microseconds. Um, and then the count rate range is also between 100 kilohertz and 3 megahertz. And then the frame rate. A frame is for us a full diffraction pattern, so you can collect continuously at a rate of 10 hertz, uh, up to 600 hertz, again, um, depending on uh, if you are working at full dynamic range. By the way, the dynamic range is the ratio, is the maximum ratio that you can have between uh, the, the highest and the smallest uh, number of counts. So 24 bits dynamic range means that you can read one count and two elevated to 24, so more than 16 million counts at the same time, which is very important when you have um, a material that um, emits has a very, very little count, so you have a very um, light um, elements together with very uh, strong emitted elements, and then you want to uh, record at the same time a very, very small signal and a very high signal, um, and, and it does, I mean, you cannot count, counting for a longer time to have this little peak coming out will not uh, work uh, completely by itself because at a certain point you will saturate your detector. So it's important to have this. I mean, this is the importance of the dynamic range. Um, okay, and then is the other important thing is that it's gateable and triggerable. It means that you can synchronize your detector. So you, when you do uh, time resolved, you synchronize your detector to what you are um, doing. So if you apply an electric field, then you synchronize the detector in such a way that it will count only when something is going on. Okay, so maybe very briefly, I would like to uh, point your attention to what it means, um, direct conversion, single photon counting. Uh, we have heard about position sensitive detector. What is important with this uh, detector is that um, it does a direct conversion and a single photon counting. So something you have already learned from Pamela about these discriminator uh, detectors, what they do. So essentially the uh, X-rays arrive to, I mean, these are, these are two subsequent strips, no? At this uh, distance of 50 microns, not that we call a pitch of the, of the detector. So uh, the X-rays arrives on the um, uh, s sensor, so on the strip and they produce electron hole pairs that are internally separated by an electric field and they reach the electrons. Then, <coughs> so they reach the electrons, uh, the electrons and they produce a pulse. Now this pulse is amplified and shaped and is compared to a threshold, a threshold that the user can change. So depending on your experiment, you can tune this threshold. So um, only the, the signal which is above this uh, threshold will be counted as one count. So if you have fluorescence, then you just adjust your threshold in such a way that is above 
the uh, fluorescence threshold. And, and therefore, you clean completely from fluorescence, which is very, very important, as you have understood from Pamela as well. Um, OK, here I repeated the, uh, the, um, the properties. Um, now, the, so this, this detector has been invented um, since it is extremely fast. So originally, it was really thought for time-resolved experiments. And it's certainly ideal for that. But, but then when we started facing problems like radiation damage that we have heard yesterday about, then we um, thought that it could have been a good alternative uh, to solve differently uh, for a different approach. And so we decided to um, push the use of the methane detector also for structural solution air refinements. And <clears throat> so here you see how devastating can be radiation damage at a synchrotron. So this is an example of an organic sample collected um, uh, and uh, being destroyed after only a few minutes. So you have heard that um, there are different ways to face this, uh, this uh, problem of radiation damage. So you can go a low, or lower temperature. You can uh, optimize the photon energy. And then uh, Irene Marjolaki can certainly uh, comment on that. There was yesterday um, a question concerning that. And indeed, the higher energies turn out to be convenient to reduce the radiation damage, simply because the absorption is, uh, is less important. And then also we have heard uh, from Kenneth this idea of um, Andy, Fitch, and co-workers to um, apply a transversal, transversal motion of the capillary with respect to the incident beam. And this has worked fairly well, but there is always this uh, potential uh, danger of um, not knowing when you step size to collect your two theta, you never know exactly when this radiation damage is occurring. Um, so the other alternative would be to do a very fast and, uh, uh, acquisition data with Newton and a parallel acquisition. So the, the 120 degrees, in our case, all at once. And so we have uh, decided to push in this direction. And uh, so we have really invested a lot of energies in the uh, beamline optics optimization, parallel beam, uh, parallel aberration, uh, free incident beam, etc. And then all this is described in this article, this review article that we have recently published, in case you have interest. OK, so here is an example Then maybe I have time to show you in a bit more details. Um, so here's an example of upivacaine hydrochloride. So these data were collected first with the multicrystal analyzer detector. You see here the first scan it was only 15 minutes uh, for 50 degrees into theta. So you see it's a fairly reasonable pattern. Then we collected a second time, and then it was evident that something was going on. And then with a the fresh sample, we just turned to the methane detector. And, uh, and you see that in one, se one second, you see how many features we were already missing um, because of radiation damage. So, so our strategy is to, uh, to collect very, very fast patterns, multiple, and then inspect them and sum them up only when they do not really show any um, trace of, uh, of um, radiation damage. So here, very quickly, of course, the resolution is, uh, is not as high as the uh, multicrystal analyzer detector, but it's not always necessary, that high resolution. So here you have a comparison of NAC, this uh, sort of standard, uh, which has such, an it's such a small intrinsic line shape that is very often used to characterize your instrumental function. So here you see the uh, meten, NAC collected by the high resolution detector and with METEN. And you see the difference in time, acquisition time, and also in the statistics that you get here. OK, so I think I will have maybe only yeah, time for um, one, one of these examples. Um, OK, so this is the um, case of this bupi I've already shown you um, um, the uh, comparison between uh, the multicrystal analyzer and the methane detector. So here, <coughs> uh, sorry, come back for a second. So this is a local anesthetic, so, um, which is characterized by a certain number of polymorphic forms. Uh, the people in, um, in uh, uh, Uni Innsbruck, uh, Ulrich Grieser, they had um, um, found with DCS measurements uh, three phases as a function of temperature. Uh, the molecular connectivity was known, as it is often the case for organic uh, materials. 
and uh, it was also known as similar um, room temperature structure. So we have performed in situ uh, time-dependent powder diffraction patterns um, analysis. So you see here the sequence of this uh, first form corresponding to this, this form here. Uh, so this is room temperature. And then as a function of temperature, we saw the evolution of, uh, of, this, uh, of this form. And then the coexistence of form A and B, and then only form B, and so on. Then when we went through the, uh, this is a um, um, reversible um, transformation. So when we went through the irreversible transformation, then the um, recrystallization was so um, characterized by uh, preferential orientations that actually we were able to measure, to uh, define it only, uh, measure at room temperature after the transformation was occurred. Um, okay, so here is um, the uh, solution of the form A with the uh, data that were collected in a, uh, very shortly. And, uh, and this is fairly nice because uh, we were able also to get the same solution uh, with direct methods. And it was uh, accidentally we was attending this uh, workshop of Carmelo when he was presenting this new resolution bias. And, uh, and surprisingly enough, we got uh, fairly rapidly the solution even with this one. Um, okay, so I, I think I have to stop here. Uh, let me just uh, very quickly jump to, um, sorry, to this. I'd like to um, um, really acknowledge the uh, work of my colleagues at the uh, SRS, um, so the Beamline um, team, Tonio Cervellino and uh, the Beamline leader, Wilmot, and all the technical support and uh, the detector group and all our users. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Fabia, for your nice talk. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, I'm from Tech Elvira from Florence. It's just a curiosity. Yeah. Uh, for the magnetic field used in the rigor and the um, undulator, mm -hmm. you say there is a difference in amplitude. Yes. Uh, how much is this difference? Um, uh, several Tesla. Okay. Yeah. But there are magnet, um, superconductive, magnetic, or electro? These are not, uh, these are not but um, in bending magnets, you can, we actually, at the SLS, that's a good uh, point. In SLS, we also implemented the super band. Super band. Uh, these are magnetic, so bending magnets by using um, superconducting materials uh, that are characterized by the fa fairly higher uh, magnetic fields. And so they can reach locally a higher. Uh, higher energies. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in the rigor and the uh, undulators, there are electromagnet. Yeah. Simple. Okay. Thank you. Hello. I'm uh, Moritz from uh, Berlin, Germany. Probably you have a really impressive experimental setup, but probably can you summarize um, what are the, the main advantages to common uh, 2D image plate detectors? Probably the time resolution is the same as you have at the AD11 or AD31 at SF. Is it the spatial resolution? Uh, so you mean what are the differences uh, between uh, like an image plate detector yeah. and, well, an image plate is a two-dimensional di detector first. Yeah, sure. Maybe the difference is in, like between um, um, like a Pilatus detector, which is a 2D detector, and, uh, and the image plate detector. Or, um, well, first of all, the, the, an image plate detector is an integrated detector. So, for example, in the case, if you are uh, worried about fluorescence, and Pamela was really making very strong the points, then uh, with the image plate detector, you cannot, I mean, you really have to be far away from the absorption edges, you have, because you cannot discriminate. You, you, with the image plate detector, it's an integrated detector, mm -hmm. so you collect everything which comes. But the advantages of these other detectors, I mean, we are limited by the higher energy. So the detector people are working on uh, uh, other materials to uh, be able to reach, to, to, to use this detector for higher energies. Because the problem with this direct conversion is that 
um, you, um, the efficiency of these detectors at high energies becomes very low because essentially the, uh, the X-rays, the high energy X-rays go through, is, the absorption is so little that you do not produce these electron holes I was talking about and so you are not very efficient. Um, so they are working on under other materials that absorb more, but still, um, for some applications like the uh, with high energies, uh, you 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 don't have any other choice. I mean, okay. so. thank you. Uh, Saul Lapid at Stony Brook University. Um, in terms of radiation damage, um, something it's it maybe a silly question, but would you perhaps you know with the laboratory? machine you have much less uh, it's much less of an issue the synchrotron you have so much more flux it becomes an issue is there a point where you might want to reduce the flux you're getting yeah in some regard is mm -hmm. there any sort of systematic study of that that you know of actually what i uh, didn't tell you i should have told you the data that i've shown you before um, when i made this comparison actually the newton data acted at uh, reduced intensity um so is um in that case, it was 30% of the intensity. So what is important for radiation damage, and you're right, is the dose. So you better actually reduce the intensity and collect longer in such a way that you have things under control than, um, yeah. Essentially, the synchrotron, you don't use the synchrotron radiation because it's so intense in that case. You use it for other reasons, because of the resolution, because you can get rid of the uh, absorption, you can go away from the absorption edges that are bothering you, or more because of that. Uh, Alex Olienko, Regaku Europe, Berlin, Germany. Uh, what do you think? I have a short question about the focus and optics. You mentioned in your, one of the last slides. Mm -hmm. What do you think in the powder beam lines? Uh, is it more advantageous to use, uh, instead of the focus and mirrors, to use uh, compound refractive lenses and to use direct beam, which are more flexible for yeah. focusing possibilities and uh, mm. easy in alignment and so on. I, um, I remember I was working at the advanced light source when they came out this nature um, article uh, claiming, I mean, describing these uh, focusing lenses for. And I was, I mean, we were all getting very excited about it. And this is certainly a, an interesting thing, but it is wavelength dependent. I remember there was somebody who was uh, describing that at a conference and I was asking the questions because of course it could be a very good idea but it is wavelength dependent so you don't you, we will need to have like different sets of these and change different sets depending on whether we are working from 5 to 10 to 10 to 15 so at that time I abandoned the idea but yeah you are right in principle but not over such a wide energy range okay one final question please Thank you. I'm uh, Paolo Mazzeo from the University of Bologna. Uh, just uh, maybe it could be a silly question, but I want to know about uh, the sample preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to collect directly from uh, uh, thin film? Yeah. Uh, either if they are really thin, you go in transmission directly. We work very often, um, so like little, little flags, we just place them in, uh, in transmission. Then if you are very, very thick than um, before in reflection. But uh, yes, of course. Ah, by the way, a comment co concerning sample preparation, in case you have a lot of absorption. What I've been doing uh, is that dilute your sample. If you really have a very, very thick lead sample, even at the synchrotron, you have really difficulties because filling up even 0.1 millimeter capillary, well, is very tough. But point two is possible, but still it might be even too much. So what I've been doing is just diluted with something else. For example, I, you sacrifice a capillary, you smash it, and then you dilute your sample with, uh, with a light absorbing material. And so you do not bother filling up a 0.1 millimeter capillary and, and you reduce the absorption. So this is something I wanted to, myself to comment. I heard about instant coffee for that purpose, and you can wash it out later. <laughs> so before we have our coffee break, uh, there's still one housekeeping announcement.